And good morning, everyone, almost afternoon. And welcome to this keynote address and luncheon as part of the Dis Disability Symposium. My name is Marisha Lopez. I am the Program Manager for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion in the College of Arts and Sciences, and I will be the host for this session. Before we begin, I would like to note that people with vision disabilities um, take without vision disabilities, take in a lot of information uh, about the people and environment around them by just looking around. So to offer context and access for all, I will provide a brief visual description of myself. Uh, I am joining the session from a room in the Institute for Behavioral Sciences on campus. Behind me, there is a projection screen and a whiteboard. I am a Hispanic female with brown skin, long black hair in my mid thirties, and I am wearing blue jeans and a cream colored sweater with ladybugs on it. Um, for our virtual participants, I will note that closed captioning can be enabled by clicking the CC button. And before we kick off this morning's session, I would like to share a bit more about the Disability Symposium and read the CU land acknowledgement. The University of Colorado Boulder is hosting the Disability Symposium to acknowledge that more work must be done to improve inclusion of persons with disabilities on the Boulder campus. Efforts to improve inclusion must focus on students, staff, and faculty. The 2021 CU Boulder Campus Climate Survey report, which was released in April of 2022, found that 44% of undergraduate students and 47% of graduate students reported experiencing incivility in the prior 12 months. For students with disabilities, these numbers climbed to 54% and 62% respectively. The symposium is a springboard to begin campus-wide conversations on, on how each of us can improve inclusion on campus and improve support for all persons with disabilities. And now as a symposium organizer, I would like to take a moment to lead us through the CU land acknowledgement. The University of Colorado Boulder, Colorado's flagship university, honors and recognizes the many contributions of indigenous peoples in our state. CU Boulder acknowledges that it is located on the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, and many other Native American nations. Their forced removal from these territories has caused devastating and lasting impacts. While the University of Colorado Boulder can never undo or rectify the devastation wrought on Indigenous peoples, we commit to improving and enhancing engagement with Indigenous peoples and issues locally and globally. We will do this by recognizing and amplifying the voices of Indigenous CU Boulder students, staff, and faculty and their work, educating, conducting research, supporting student access, and integrating Indigenous knowledge, and lastly, consulting, engaging, and working collaboratively with tribal nations to enhance our ability to provide access and culturally sensitive support and to recruit, retain, and graduate Native American students in a climate that is inclusive and respectful. Now I have the pleasure of introducing you all to our keynote speaker, Marissa Hamamoto. She is the first professional dancer to be named People Magazine's Women Changing the World. Marissa Hamamoto is a stroke survivor with two invisible disabilities, PTSD and autism. Marissa is the founder of Infinite Flow, an award-winning nonprofit and professional dance company that employs disabled and non-disabled artists with a mission to foster inclusion. Marissa is a speaker, thought leader, performing artist, and multi-dimensional creator on the rise, seeking to creatively inspire inclusion, innovation, and transformation through movement, dance, and storytelling. So please join me in welcoming Marissa. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me at CU Boulder. Uh, this is my first time at Boulder. Excuse me. Okay, let's start with that. <laughs> uh, a quick visual description of myself. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am an East Asian woman with long black hair. Today, I am wearing a red and white polka dotted, polka -dotted blouse. And um. And I feel really energized actually just, just being in nature. So I, I feel like I'm glowing today. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, as Marisha had introduced, uh, I run a dance company called Infinite Flow, which employs dancers with and without disabilities with diverse intersectional identities. Uh, I'm gonna show a short reel uh, of my company to kind of get a um, landscape of this. And this video is audio described. Um, 
So that was audio described by a former youth student of mine who's now 18, I believe, but she was, I think she was 15 or 16 at that time. Um, Didi, uh, Didi, who now has moved out of LA into um, Oregon now, um, she, uh, she was born with uh, a, a father who was blind, was born without site and both of her parents are in the field of audio description and so she was already training to become like actually by default becoming like an audio describer so I, so this was one of her first projects where she got paid <laughs> to do audio description and you know i don't know did anybody follow the audio description it's it's a lot and so I think she really did a good job and it kind of made me go maybe that experience of actually hiring um, a teenager to do this through the guidance of the parents kind of made me go okay we can start talking about disability inclusion at an early age. So with that said. Um, I'm going to give a little quick introduction about me um, and then we will go into a little bit of disability 101 work and. Um, uh, let me, I'm just going to skip through this for a second. Okay, so a little bit about me. Um, so I was born in Irvine, California. Anybody here from California? Oh, you are? Where? Where? Um, Southern Johanga. Okay, okay. So Southern. Yeah. Like in, the, in the valley. Okay, and you? LA. LA, okay, okay. All right, cool. So I, I live a little bit south of LA. Um, and I grew up in a city called Irvine. Has anybody heard of Irvine before? Okay, okay, we've, oh wow, okay, that's great. So I grew up in Irvine during the 80s and 90s, and at this time, Irvine was a predominantly white city. Now it's like, I think 45% Asian Americans, the Asian American immigrant population has really kind of come into our city and the population has gone from, I think when I was there, it was like maybe it just it just passed 100,000. And for a while, Irvine was considered one of the safest cities in the country that had a population over 100,000. Now it's like at 250. Anyways, so I grew up in, I grew up in Irvine, California, um, in a predominantly white, white neighborhood and city, and my family being Japanese American, we were clearly a minority. At school, I got picked on for looking different, and I learned that learned at school that our differences can divide us. The highlight of my week was a weekly ballet class where though I was the only dancer of color in ballet class, as you can see from one of one of the photos on my PowerPoint here in which there are several girls that are white and then me in the center uh, with Asian being Asian and having very long thick bangs, it looks like um, and we're all wearing pink like and the teachers wearing pink too. And I always look at this photo going wow okay anyways so. Ballet class looked like this. I was the only Asian Asian girl in class, but something about moving my body to music with the other dancers made me feel like I belonged. And so from an early age of like six and seven, I didn't have words to describe it, but I realized that dance unites us despite our differences. And this experience of being six and seven and having this realization has carried me through my entire life. 
moving on. Uh, ballet dancing became my passion. It was the one place that I felt like I belonged. It was the one place that I felt like I can be free. When I was 12, I saw a performance of the New York City Ballet. Who's heard of the New York City Ballet before? Okay, New York City Ballet is like in terms of ballet, ballet company rankings and elitism, it's like number one in, in, in our country. Um, and I saw a performance of the New York City Ballet at the local theater. And I was just mesmerized, you know, being 12, loving to dance. And I'm looking at all these wonderful dancers in front of me. And I was like, oh, I want to become a ballerina one day. <laughs> now, what I didn't connect was no one on that stage looked like me. Everybody was Caucasian, except for one. There's one African-American dancer. And I, I, I remember now, now looking back at at me at that time, I remember like even though she was part of the quarter ballet, and for those who don't know what the quarter ballet, it's the ensemble. So you're, there might be 30 girls dancing together. She was part of the ensemble, but I remember going, oh wow, there's a black dancer, you know? And so, but either way, nobody looked like me. Uh, long story short, I did pursue, I, I did aspire to become a ballerina. But I was constantly told that my body was not right. And this was not just my ethnicity, but I was told that my feet don't point enough, my hips don't turn out, I'm overweight, uh, my neck is too short, my head is too round. I mean, it was like as if every single part of my body was like wrong, you know? But me just having this dream and being very persistent, this is what I dream dreamed of, becoming a professional ballerina. Uh, and I will say that, you know, I lived in this duality of knowing that dance is a universal language that belongs to everyone, yet, hmm, but the ballet world that I'm trying to seek is saying that dance is only exclusive for a few. So I started living in this duality. I didn't do anything about it at this time, but it definitely, you know, has obviously um, impacted me. Uh, throughout my life. Now, during my teens, um, there's one thing I did during my senior high school year that really impacted me for the rest of my career. And I actually just finished creating a five minute short film about this. And so could I show it? <laughs> Is it okay? Okay, because I feel like I can talk about it. But I feel like, you know, my filmmaker and I, we really collaborated a lot on this. And I do apologize. I just we just finished the audio descriptions, but they haven't been embedded in it. But there's a lot of dialogue. I think if you do, um, if you are blind, I think you'll be able to follow this story. So here it goes. People know me as the stroke survivor who founded Infinite Flow, an award-winning dance company that fosters disability inclusion. But here's the backstory that never gets told. I was as an aspiring ballet dancer, but I was constantly rejected for not having the right ballet body. Until senior year, where I received a scholarship to attend a performing arts high school that valued diversity and inclusion. For the first time, I felt like I belonged. The last performance was a student choreography concert where each of the senior dance majors, including myself, had an opportunity to choreograph a six-minute work. <laughs> On the day that casting was announced, I snuck into the dance studio a little earlier than everyone. I couldn't <coughs> wait to see which of my classmates had selected me into their work. Being able to dance in my friend's choreography meant everything to me. This was going to be the highlight of my year, <coughs> and I approached the department bulletin board. I look up and down the casting notice, and I don't see my name anywhere except for a choreographer for my own work. I look again, and my name is not there. I thought these were my friends. Am I just not good enough? Did they just not like me? Was this how my year was going to end? But when I looked again, I noticed something else. There were seven other students missing from the cast. This isn't right. Everyone should be included. It's not fair for anyone to be left out. 
the one I went, I took out a pencil out of my backpack, took a deep breath, and wrote down all seven names into my own cast. haven't posted this on YouTube yet, so you all are lucky. <laughs> um, one reason why I chose to create this film is, as I kind of said in the film in the very beginning, I am the, oftentimes the media or anytime I get any sort of like public recognition, I'm, cons I, you know, Marissa, the stroke survivor who was once paralyzed from the neck down is now, uh, now has this dance company with disabled dancers. Like that's the story that gets told. But, and, and that is a true fact. Like when I was in college, I was actually a college senior when the stroke happened. Um, that is a true fact. However, like it was just the taking out the being left out of, from my own classmates and, um, and then taking action. And then that small action of writing down seven names le led to policy change. That whole like scenario really, really was what kind of got me. And I think we even regardless of what our identities are, dis disabled or not, whatever race, gender, whatever you identify with, we all have the experience of being excluded 
even on the scale of and I and this is me, I have some interesting feet. <laughs> Whenever I go to the shoe store, none of the shoes fit me. And it's like, why can't they make shoes for me, my feet, you know, even like that experience, like of like going shopping and realizing that certain clothes don't fit you. That's also a type of exclusion. So anyways, um, I'm going to zip through and I want to kind of get to some um, conceptual things, but um, Okay, because we're out of college, I did, you know, this, I, I went to a, a Japanese university. Uh, and the one thing I'll say about this is, as I mentioned, I grew up in Irvine in a predominantly white city, being one of the only Asian Americans, and not fitting the box and constantly being in environments where I found myself as one of the only Asians or one of the only people of color. Then I go to college in Japan. And now I'm surrounded by people that look like me. Yet I still felt like an outsider. And a lot of that has to do with having grown up, you know, being fluent in Japanese, looking Japanese, but having grown up, growing up in the States, how I carried myself was already different. Um, I was told I was too loud, that I said my opinion too much, and that there's a, con there's a uh, proverb in J J Japanese that says that the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. And I was always that nail that, st that stood up. Um, at least that's how the Japanese culture saw me. So what I learned was even in a, even in a culture like Japan, where it's kind of like mono race, like 99% of Japan is like Japanese blooded people, there's still like a lack of diversity and inclusion. And that too kind of made me think through over the years, well, let's go, let's, let's talk about, let's think about diversity and inclusion and equity beyond just identities. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to kind of skip through, um, okay, so I'm going to skip through some of this, so, um, maybe I shouldn't, okay, <laughs> no, because <laughs> I want to get to questions, um, so I was a senior, senior in college, as college when the stroke happened, this happened inside of a contemporary dance class, uh, I was taking outside of campus late at night, and in the middle of the class, my elbow started to tingle and momentarily I fell to the ground. I couldn't move my arms, I couldn't move my legs, and I found myself paralyzed from the neck down. And um, I was carried to the hospital and a couple days later I was diagnosed with spinal cord infarction, also known as spinal stroke, and was told by the doctor that I may never be able to walk or dance again. Now clearly, I do not consider myself a physically disabled person anymore, but having been a dancer, uh, my whole life and suddenly not being able to move, um, I really thought my life, my, my dance career was over at this time. For me, because I had never seen anyone with a physical disability or paralysis, I should say dance, like that was, that was my perception at that time. And obviously now it's, it's changed. So how I arrived at Infinite Flow is after I recovered, well, recovered physically and emotionally from the stroke or in that process of in, in that journey of recovery, I had um, come across ballroom dancing and I started ballroom dancing for two reasons. One was that um, my stroke had happened at the C6 and C7 level here. And for anyone that's got any any idea on the C6, C7 area when it comes to the spinal cord, it's connected to my extremities, specifically my my hands, my wrists. And so um, at, you know, even three years after my stroke, I was still having di difficulty with my dexterity. And so part of getting into ballroom and salsa dancing was like, because we use our hands a lot to connect, I thought that this would be good rehab. And surely enough, it was. The second reason is, I'm, and I'm not going to go into, into this story right this moment, or right today at least, is um, I was sexually assaulted three times between the ages of 19 and 27. And um, alongside getting a stroke at 24. So I was in addition to kind of like dealing with my trauma from the stroke, I was also dealing with the trauma from these sexual assaults and that the first sexual assault was actually by one of my ballet teachers. And, and that kind of intersection really like conflict, really kind of put me in a lot of turmoil in the sense that the teacher that raped me it, and then getting a stroke, he also really 
also um, put in my head that I would never become a dancer. So the stroke almost felt like a curse. Um, so I was dealing with PTSD. I didn't have the vocabulary to name it PTSD. Uh, my family, I grew up in a family and environment where mental health or mental health and mental illnesses, talking about that was taboo, um, which is still a lot of the world, I would say. And so I didn't quite get the support, but oftentimes, um, you know, we are intersectional beings, like just because you have one type of disability or one type of identity or one type of chronic illness or whatever that may be, that's not the only thing we all deal with, right? So, um, so intersectionality is a huge keyword in what I do today. Um, so anyway, so that was 2006, the stroke happened in 2006. I started ballroom dancing in 2010. And then I moved back to LA from Tokyo and started doing what we called the LA thing, you know, trying to be a model, trying to be an actor, trying to be a dancer, and <laughs> it, which is like, or trying to be part of this entertainment industry. So I, I you know, I was in my early 30s and um, I was like, all right, this is my second chance to do this, make this like dream dance career happen. So I went full force. But again, as I said in the film, I, I found myself not fitting the box all over. Um, how Infinite Flow came about uh, was that it really started with me thinking through who is left out, what can I do, how can I make a difference, and meeting one dancer, which one dancer in this case it's Adelho, who is still who I still dance with, one of my wheelchair dancers, who is pictured. He is not pictured in here. <laughs> He's always pictured in all my photos. But meeting one wheelchair dancer and then dancing with him in a studio, um, there was this magical moment where initially I was terrified to dance with Adelpho, but after a couple hours of dancing with him, I realized that dancing with Adelpho was nothing different from anyone else. And that aha moment of, oh my gosh, like when we're dancing with someone, like you see beyond all these labels, whether it's race, color, size, age, gender, disability, sexual orientation. And that's the beauty of dance. It truly is a universal language and we can have beautiful connections. Like I like to say that even if you're politically far left and far right, you can still have a good dance. Like I used to dream about having like Trump and Obama danced together. <laughs> like uh, I was like, I bet you anything. I mean, and it, even though they're both men, they're he I think, as far as I know, heterosexual men. Um, I still feel like they can still like come to come together. You know. So, anyways, but that's how powerful I feel about dance. Is that it's like it's almost like I like to consider it like a soft weapon. Like if everybody danced in this world, it would be so much more of a happier place because we just realize that. Um, you know, we're just all humans just trying to live a good life and there's just so much more commonality. Um, okay, moving on. So one thing that um, I wanna say here, here's a bunch of media and logos, you know, from brands down there. I'm, I'm, I put this slide, not just not to brag about it, but we are making progress with, with how much media and how much awareness there is in the mainstream like i know that sometimes like when we talk about like social justice issues we end up kind of getting stuck in the problems um yet there is there is definitely dei and a a stands for accessibility is a thing it's becoming more of a thing and i know that in the disability justice movement sometimes there's an there's an emphasis a strong emphasis on anti-capitalism that but I do feel that we need to work together as a collective, whether you are all, whether you're a millionaire or whether you are a hungry artist, I think we can all work together towards creating a more inclusive world. Um, just last thing about my personal story that I want to mention is it's only in the last couple years since the pandemic that I was diagnosed with PTSD and autism. Now, PTSD, I know I've had this since my late teens when I was first raped. Um, and autism was something that, like, as I learned more about neurodiversity through my work at Infinite Flow, and then also got my brother diagnosed with autism, and he really needed to get a diagnosis um, to get, get receive the proper support. I realized that I was checking a lot of boxes <laughs> and I'm like, hmm, maybe
maybe I should I should get this checked out. And so I did. And um, I was I, you know, based on what I read, I was thinking, do I have ADHD, autism, or both? And so the psychologist diagnosed with, with me with autism. But here's what I'll say to this. Um, it took me about eight months until I was openly able to say that I'm autistic. And you would think after leading a dance company like Infinite Flow, like it's, it's like a no brainer, but I had to personally after six, seven years of leading Infinite Flow, kind of really review my own ableism. Like I was scared to call myself autistic because I thought, oh my gosh, what if some of my partners and clients think that I'm not capable? And I went through a period of, wow, but hold on here, what are we trying to preach and teach through my work? So I had to do some deep digging and also a lot of like, um, also kind of like just letting go of trauma. So in terms of my autism, um, how it has showed up, and I shared a little bit earlier today is A, I, I have noise sensitivity. Uh, I think the earliest time that I realized that something is different about me when it comes to that is I was, I, I tried tap dancing when I was seven and I loved it. I loved it, you know, but the tap, the tap, the noisy taps on the floor somehow echoed through my body and gave me headaches. And so I came home from dance class saying, mom, I don't know, I've got a headache. I don't know what it is. And after four classes, my mom was like, all right, if you're getting headaches each time, this should not work. And so we let go of tap, even though I really liked it. And then when I was 19, I tried flamenco and flamenco is also a lot of pounding of the feet. And the same thing happened. Like, like it wasn't just like, oh, it's, it's a little noisy. Let me, uh, let me just, um, I'll just process that for the hour. Be okay. It's like we're after the one hour flamenco class for the whole day, I would have like these echoing, like, like this echoing headache, I, you know, that would be going on. Um, so that's one thing is that, and so to this day, I, I'll, I'll say that how it affects me in my communication today is that this environment is great. There's rarely any like extra noise around um, so today, like like in er the earlier lecture, I was able to hear it, everything. It was great. But imagine if like there's a bunch of people around chit chatting, and then there's loud music playing, and then someone's trying to present, um, with, or some, or you're trying to have a conversation with someone in that environment. For me, it's like even though I can physically hear that person, I can't process anything that's going on. So it just gives me anxiety. And um, and I'll be very honest, I think I hid that for a long time. I would pretend like I'm listening. And then later on, when someone says, I told you this and that, I'm going, oh my God, I don't remember that. I don't remember that. I mean, from a more personal level, I'm with an ex-boyfriend. He just constantly blamed me that I was not a good listener, you know, and, and again, he, you know, we hung out a lot at kind of noisy clubs and stuff. And so, but like, I never advocated for myself and I don't think it was the right relationship anyway. So maybe it was okay that that got left that way. But, but regardless, like, um, it's like where now I'm learning, I'm just learning to self advocate. So a couple of things I want to say here, there is nothing scary about a diagnosis. The diagnosis actually gave me more clarity than confusion. Um, I think above all, I was able to go, oh, there's nothing wrong with me. These, this is just who I am. We all have access needs. And okay, and that's another thing that I want to say here is that it's not just disabled people that need access. Like everybody has access needs. So that might be like, who's a morning person here? Okay, I'm a morning person. Okay, so we have about a third of the room that's a morning person. Who's more of like a night owl? Okay, that's the rest of the room. Okay, who's more of like an after, like who does their best work in the afternoon? Okay, there's a few people, okay, <laughs> right? So that's, and, and so like from a, um, whether it's, whether you're a student trying to study for tests or intense tests, like, or if you're, an, you're, you're a professional, you know, you wanna do your most intense work at, the, at your peak hours. Right, and that's that's access needs too. Like if you're a student, maybe you can manage your schedule according to what works for you. If you're in a professional environment, maybe you can ask your supervisor about like what best it is to accommodate how you work the best. Um, 
you know, I'm someone that always has to have water with me. It's like, it's just, I get, I, I, it's kind of a combination of just cooling my body down because I do get overheated, but it's also just like, I, I tend to get dehydrated very easily. So, I mean, that's also an access need and that has nothing to do with my autism or PTSD or being a stroke survivor. So if we start thinking about access needs more as what do we need to do the best work possible, then it goes beyond disability. And sometimes like, you know, and I heard a little bit about the boycott, you know, and there's a little bit of like division here. And I think like when it comes to disability, sometimes, sometimes um, I feel like disability itself can get a little, be working in its own silo. But if we start educating ourselves that we, we actually all need access needs and we all need accommodations, and some people need specific, some people are a little bit more general, then I think we can be more empathetic towards each other. Okay, all right. Um, I am gonna just buzz through that. I will send the slides out, but I, I put a bunch of information in the slides on purpose. Um, I'm not gonna go through too much of this, but as we all know, one in four Americans have a disability. Uh, less than half of disabled people are employed compared to nearly uh, three quarters of people that without a disability. Um, 1.7 billion people globally have a disability. 70 to 80% of disabled people have invisible or non-obvious disabilities. And that's something to really note. And that's that was a statistic that was like, what? 70 to 80% of people with disabilities have invisible disabilities? So we don't want to make assumptions. Um, and disability is the one minority group that anyone can enter at any time. So disability, like sometimes like within the DEI, DEI like diversity, when we're talking about diversity inclu inclusion, it's either forgotten or considered last, but it's actually the most prominent one that exists. Um, uh, one thing I'll say about the disability community is if we if we look at disability rights history and what's been written out there, it's oftentimes led by white non-disabled heteronormative people. And I, I just want to call this out because ideally it's ideally we want like disabled people are spread across all genders, all races, and we need leadership to also reflect that. Um, Sometimes the disability community is like, or disability effort, uh, disability inclusion efforts are kind of clumped into one. But I just want to point out that even within that movement, we have some work to do on the side of representation, even within that minority group. Um, okay, so on with, we know the problem. I just want to briefly introduce my framework around creating disability inclusion. And I call this human. A human so and it's human is an acronym uh, h stands for heart start with your heart you understand the basics m make it known you care a ask and i've actually added act now and n never underestimate your impact i'm just going to quickly go over just the h and with the u stuff i'm going to just overview it and then later on um, there's a QR code where I can send you a, a bunch more information. Um, so heart, the most important thing I find from doing this work with disability inclusion is heart. I knew nothing about disability inclusion except for my own experience as a stroke survivor when I started Infinite Flow. All there was was that is my heart. I just saw from my film, I don't think anyone should be excluded. Let's, if someone is excluded, okay, let's figure that out. Um, have I always been perfect at providing access and making that bridge happen? No, not at all. But I've learned along the way, but my heart was always there. I was like, we got to make this work. You know, we got to make this work. I mean, simple example. I mean, this is like, so that's my cell phone right there on top of like two boxes and I like popped up in a water bottle. So I forgot my tripod, okay? And I'm like, but I still wanna get this on my, on my, on my new iPhone here. So I'm like, all right, let me, just, let me just create a tripod for myself, right? And as I was creating, I was, as I was just doing, as I was stacking up boxes, <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is the process that we use at Infinite Flow. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we have a little challenge and we just created make make it work with the, what we have, 
So I know that this is like <laughs> not the best example, but yes, that's what it is. So just I just want to kind of share a couple of my principles here with heart. There's more. There's I, I mean, I can give like a three day workshop on this, but we're going to keep it simple. Um, so this is a pretty obvious kind of mindset, and I, I like to say heart set. Um, the diverse human race is beautiful. Everyone deserves to dance. It's pretty obvious, but you'll be surprised on on how many people actually don't believe this. And whether this is in the context of dance or not, like we have these, we have we make judgments over X Y Z activity is only for this type of people or that people. But no, this dance and whatever activity you want to call it is for everyone. Um, inclusion inspires innovation. Does anybody know the story behind the typewriter? Anybody know that? Okay. So this is one of my favorite stories. Oftentimes, this, oftentimes the world's greatest inventions have been designed for disability. So um, the story behind the typewriter. So during, during the early 1800s, there was a woman by the name of Carolina Fantoni da Fivizano, and she was losing her vision slowly. And she wanted to write a love letter, but the only way to have a, have a blind person write anything was if that person voiced it and someone else transcribed it. Um, for a love letter, you kind of don't want to voice it out and have some, some like, I don't know, stranger transcribe it. So she just happened to have a friend who was also an inventor named Pellegrino Turi. And Pellegrino was like, Oh, okay, well, let me come up with the solution. And that became the first iteration of the typewriter. And, it, and many, many iterations later, we have our iPhones, we have our typewriters, we have our laptops and our computers and type pads, etc. So again, a blind person wanting to write a love letter in her privacy led to the invention of the typewriter. I mean, that's pretty incredible. Another one of my favorite stories is, is email. Email was invented by a deaf engineer seeking a way to communicate with his deaf wife at a distance. His name is Vinton Cerf. And if you kind of look up the, the story behind email, there are a few different theories behind this, but he is mentioned within most of the theories, I would say. Uh, and I know that he did take a big part, even if he was not the only, only um, inventor of email. But either way, a deaf engineer was trying to communicate with his deaf white at a distance. Let's come up with a solution. And that became email. And obviously, email has transformed the way that we communicate with each other. Touchscreen. Touchscreen was invented by a man with carpal tunnel syndrome, finding a way to interact with the computer screen without applying pressure to his joints. This is pretty incredible, too, if you think about it. So. Inclusion inspires innovation. In the work I do at Infinite Flow, sometimes it is challenging to make it make things work for someone with a non-traditional body. But I keep in mind that inclusion inspires innovation. Through this, through the process of solving this challenge, we're going to come up with something amazing and magical through that process. So that's something to um, note. And from a campus perspective, let's say we're trying to solve a access challenge. And it's just like, it's one of those challenges that's like just not going anywhere, right? The process of trying to solve that challenge is going to lead to some amazing good things that may be directly related to the problem and directly not. So it's important to not ignore these challenges, but actually, actually um, step into it. Um, okay, translate, don't adapt. So we hear of words like adaptive clothing, adaptive sports, adaptive gaming, adaptive dance. My question to you is, who is adapting to who? So in a way, adapt, the word adaptive, adapt, may seem empowering and inclusive, but it also points to the fact that there is a standard body and we're trying to conform to that standard body. So at Infinite Flow, we use the word translate instead of adapt. So imagine there was an amputee dancer, a wheelchair dancer, so someone with a non-traditional physical body, 
Sometimes it's, it's, it's the wheelchair dancer that will translate movement from a body like mine. And in, in my case, I don't, consider to ha I don't consider myself to have a physical disability anymore. But sometimes I might be translating movement from the wheelchair dancer or the dancer with one leg, et cetera. So translation goes always. And it's just the concept that we each have a unique body and we can translate movement into our own unique bodies. Um, sometimes to kind of just, just for fun, we've created some what we call translation videos. And yes, this is still a little one way, but I'm just going to show a Okay, and that's it's a little bit, again, it's still, it's a little one sided, but sometimes like for, for, you know, like, we like to show this sometimes going, okay, you know, we can translate, like, movement from one body to another. And it's not necessarily always getting the exact, like, aesthetic, but it's kind of getting the essence of movement. Um, this is another example. Stair cuff. And what are my dancers? <laughs> Derek, Derek actually actually is kind of someone in my community, um, but um, he he actually wrote wrote to us on Instagram saying, "Okay, I think he did that better." <laughs> but anyways. Um, so yes, we can translate. Now that was a little bit one-sided. I'm hoping to um, create another video that goes the other way now. Um, but yeah, translation. There's no body hierarchy. There's no standard body. We're all just unique bodies. You know, even with two non-disabled bodies, like we're going to be translating movement differently here because we have different bodies. Um, okay, this one's big. And I don't. How are you on time? Oh my God. What time are we doing this till? No, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna finish with this concept, and then we'll open up to up to questions. Um, okay. Dance towards systemic change. Um, so, has anybody heard of the word systemic change? Is something okay? All right. So this is a concept that I learned maybe three, four years ago, I would say, and I was like, oh. So there's a difference between charity versus systemic change. Charity is kind of a first aid kit um, where you're put, it's a kind of a putting a band-aid on a solution versus systemic change is getting to the root cause. So if we take homelessness as an example, and, and, I'm, and I, excuse, I excuse me for, this is kind of the simplest example, but not the best example, is like feeding the homeless it's kind of a band-aid. You can feed the feed and feed, but does that solve the root cause of homelessness? No. So, and same thing when it comes to disability too, is like, it got me thinking about, okay, well, as a dance company that is about disability inclusion, is us, um, well, okay, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me backtrack. Um, sometimes with dis disability related activities, they're oftentimes run in silos, like a wheel, well, a wheelchair dance class or um, uh, hiking for the blind. Like, you know, and, and, and these services, these disability services are awesome and great. And it does build camaraderie between like, like people that share common um, experiences. Though, so they're important, but in the ideal world, if we're talking about dance, any dance class, dance program, dance function should be inclusive and accessible, period. We want to bring that, uh, that change, we want to bring the change systemically, right? So within the work I do at Infinite Flow, I really had to kind of think through how do we create systemic change? And if our vision is an accessible and inclusive world where everyone feels they belong can thrive, and our mission is to create a more inclusive world, one dance at a time, I, as I, over the years, identify three places 
that we can embark on. And one is um, show the beauty of inclusion. This is through more of our performances, our content, how we perceive the world is like, is oftentimes dictated by the media that we consume, unfortunately. So yes, let's keep creating things that really dismantle that stereotype and really show the beauty of inclusion. Um, uh, some context. So with elementary school students and actually people of all ages, we've done this survey where we will ask people, what are the first three words that come to mind when it comes to disability? And 70 to 80% of people will have negative words. Like kids will answer things like bad, sad, ugly, not my friend. Um, we've heard from adults, um, limited, uh, incapable. Um, we, so it's negative words. After showing a video of ours or after, after experiencing a performance of ours, those three words, change we know we don't get any negative words and even that sizzle reel that that 90 second sizzle reel that i showed we, we i've done before and after on like zoom webinars and just in 90 seconds people's perceptions change so that is one way that we are creating systemic change second is and we do need to do a better job on this one i think um is it's a really build community around people that really believe in this inclusive world, because we do need to work together as a collective, uh, you know, to bring this about. The third one, and this one that this one's actually a big one that I am I am diving into uh, this next next year, is to educate leadership and shape tomorrow's leaders and youth. And this is kind of in two two prongs. One is one is uh you know I I get too many inquiries from people with disabilities and their families and friends saying that they can't they don't have any dance classes to go to in whatever area they're in and I really think that every single dance teacher movement instructor should be able to teach anyone with anybody <laughs> so I'm being called to to do more teacher training um, and do it at a kind of a more intersectional level I've gotten inquiries for this from actually the first year of building infinite flow and I was definitely not ready and but right now i'm like you know what I think I am I think I am so this next year i'll be slowly carrying on some teacher training. The second part is I really think that if kids from a young age are introduced to diversity equity inclusion and accessibility, they will grow up with that so. One of the programs that we love doing is our elementary school assembly programs. Um, I think I have, actually, I can skip that. Um, uh, one, of, one of the programs that we love doing is going into elementary schools and performing. And I swear, even though it might have been a 45 minute experience for those kids, they will never, ever forget our assembly and they will grow up thinking about disability differently. So there's a couple things is like we've gotten way too many inquiries for elementary school assemblies to the point that I cannot accommodate, at least with the current capacity that I have at my team. And we can't quite scale ourselves because it's just, I mean, what we do is also very high quality. So I'm I'm thinking through business wise, how can we how can we how can we be the next dare? The other part that I'm embarking on is when I looked at the law, the legislation around education, I found out that disability history, awareness, and inclusion are not part of mainstream cur curriculum. So over the next year, I am putting together a task force and really going after changing that legislation. Like, imagine if all kids learn that learn that and 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 what 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 we've also seen happen is if i go back to the our elementary school assembly programs the schools that are booking us locally in the southern california region tend to come from neighborhoods with household income 150 grand and over so these are affluent neighborhoods that are booking us and we're not getting around to the title one schools and the schools that we actually really really need it and in order for like and, and that's really bothers me it's kind of gotten to the point where i now i don't we do one school assembly a month because it's just for my own mental wellness it just doesn't fly for fly to me anymore uh but so in order to kind of change that landscape okay legislation has to change for there for for there to be more funding for the schools to implement these programs 
So anyways, if anybody is interested in joining our national task force, um, in it's, it's at this infancy stage, but I'm, I decided to go for it um, now. What's interesting is if we're talking about legislation for a moment, so everybody knows about the um, Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and the ADA of 1990. Is, is everyone familiar with this? Do I need to review this? No, we're good? Okay. So, so alongside that in 1975 was the Handicapped Children's Act, which, which ensured equal and equal access to children with, with children with disabilities in schools. And then it was kind of revised and revamped in 1990 as the IDEA Act, um, IDEA Act, ensuring that children with disabilities have good, have equal access to education. So this is like anything from IEPs, um, indiv individualized education plans for if a student has a disability and need accommodations that they're able to get it from public education to all kinds of different accommodations. So that's there, but what's not there is like, for the mainstream edu in mainstream education is for children to actually learn about disability at all. There's none of that. There's a couple states that have adopted like a disability history week in October. So October we tend to, we tend to get flooded with a lot of inquiries uh, over school assemblies, but it's not required. It's, it's like a it's an optional thing. And, and what tends to happen is that kind of the more affluent neighborhood schools tend to embark on it and the rest left get left behind. And the affluent neighborhoods, they tend to have PTAs that have money. <laughs> That's why. Anyways, um, so with that said, um, I'm just going to end here with um, going back to this human. Uh, yes. Um, so everything starts with heart. Understand, I'm just going to br briefly go through this. Understand the basics is anything from understanding legislation to inclusive language to um, disability etiquette. It's kind of like the what, what I call disability 101 and having like a general understanding of that. Making known you care is like even before you've made change to accommodating, let people know we are XYZ club on campus and we are going to ensure do everything we can to keep our club inclusive and accessible and diverse and you know all of that make it known make it known you know because guess what once you make that public you know you're going to live up to that you know whether you're a club you're a person your business etc um ask is like ask is like just don't make assumptions one thing that can easily be done for talking about campus events is just add one question at the end what access needs do you have? What do you need? You know, how can we help you? Just again, it kind of goes back to like, you know, your heart too, uh, but just ask. And N is never underestimate your impact. Remember the, sorry, around the typewriter, email, touchpad. Yes, this work around inclusion and equity is it's tough. It's challenging. It's like, um, I mean, I mean, I go to therapy <laughs> in between this because I there's just so much emotions that get processed. But I also know that working through these challenges is going to lead to something beautiful and amazing. So, anyways, that's um, I I I will send these slides out. I obviously over prepared. Um, uh, but um, a couple things. If you would like to connect with me, I'm very act on social media. I'm active on LinkedIn and Instagram. There's my email. Uh, I I get so many questions around disability inclusive language, and so I have created a guide. Um, if you want to scan the QR code, go go ahead. I will be sending out the renewed version next week. Uh, language is evolving, so it's not like I have the answers to everything, but I think having some background around that and also, an, an, you know, I'm also going to provide an, like a outlet for the community to actually like voice their opinions around this topic too. So anyways, thank you and I will open up the floor for a couple questions. <laughs> so, does anybody have any questions? I know that we have a few minutes, I'm going to say we're going to go till 1245. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I and your name is? Grace. Grace, thank you. Um, I want to practice this question by telling you that I'm also a dancer with CPSD. And I um, have recently, this year alone, started doing partner work, learning salsa, doing contact improv. Love it. Um, which I've been avoiding for a really long time. And I've noticed that that's also kind of a common experience sometimes. I was wondering if you faced that when you started, like the avoidance of partner work when you started doing salsa. 
and ballroom dancing and if how you advocated for yourself and how you would like to see kind of partner work become more inclusive of people that need that kind of advocation and accommodation for um, disorders. Like yeah, deep long. question. Okay, <laughs> no, no, it's okay. So first, um, a little proverb or Marissaism that I want to put out there is fear is a compass of where we need to grow. In my case, um, as a multiple sexual assault survivor, I feared human contact. This is like, and this is like four and a half, no, three, three and a half years after having a stroke. The stroke felt like a curse from uh, the dance teacher that sexually assaulted me when I was a teenager. So it's just all like jumbled up. And so um, at that time, I very much feared human contact. But just through, you know, I was also kind of in a little bit of this personal development journey. I was reading books around getting out of your comfort zone and, and letting go of what doesn't serve you anymore. And what, what didn't serve me anymore was this, this fear of human contact, because I also craved connection and friends. Like, I really craved that, but I was scared to like, so anyways, it was, so it was a lot of like, kind of like personal discovery work that I did in the, in leading up to that moment. Um, what I realized was once I got into my first salsa class, yes, I was shit scared going into it, but something about dancing with strangers was comfortable and it felt natural and organic. And it was like, it was also kind of me overcoming my fear. So it was just very much this cathartic experience, you know, and Yes, I know many around me who um, who have like who who do not like touch and do not like to be touched, and that needs to be respected too. And I think there's a way to still make partner work happen um, without that touch. I mean, during the pandemic, I saw some interesting things where people were holding like these um, sticks and partnering with each other like this. I I saw some people doing like trying to partner with each other, like with just following hands. I mean, people got really creative, I thought. I thought, um, And if that is the limit, then that is the limit. That is, that is, I don't say the limit. If that is what, where you can go, that's where you can go. Um, I think my work with Infinite Flow, we definitely put out like with community, our community workshops, we definitely lay out some community, uh, community, what do we usually call them? Community um, guidelines and groundwork. Like we just make sure that everybody's on the same page when it comes to safety and um, respect for each other's bodies. We put that out there. Not all spaces do that. So I wish more spaces would do that more. Um, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, you totally did. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank, yeah, you. thank you. Yeah, anybody else have anything? Yes. So being like late diagnosed with autism, did you experience any like imposter syndrome or were you like um, having trouble identifying yourself that way and worried about you know, speaking for a community you weren't sure about? You? You, you know, what was interesting was I was relieved that I was autistic. It kind of gave me a lot of like, like clarity. Like I thought again, because like, for example, okay. Uh, family members, because I had a lot of social anxiety and I tended to isolate myself, a lot of my family members really put me down for not knowing how to socialize. And that really, like, so I grew up thinking I was, there's something wrong with me. And um, there was family members that would jokingly say, oh, you'll never get married. You'll never have a boyfriend. You'll never have friends. You're, you know, like, and, and they're joking. But, you know, as a kid, it's like, it's, it hurts, you know? Like to this day, my mother sometimes <laughs> has to, like now, now, though she, now we, we can kind of, I can joke back and then she realizes that, okay, she needs to stop, you know, stop that too. But anyways, um, putting that all aside, um, I, I think, okay, yeah, so, but, like, I'm not, I mean, I am on social media consistent, I don't want to say consistent, but on a weekly basis, I post one thing, right, you know, and it's, and sometimes, not that social media is everything, but I am someone that kind of 
intentionally like put put a lot of intention into anything I put out there because you don't know who's going to read that and as a leader in, as a leader myself like I, I just want to make sure that anything I put out there is like is something meaningful <laughs> so when I got to my computer to write a post about my autism I was like oh I'm not ready for this I don't want to be labeled as autistic. I was okay with the PTSD. It was pretty like two weeks after my diagnosis, I told people that I was, I had PTSD and, you know, and out goes a post that goes viral about, about it. But with autism, I was just like, I'm not ready to like say this. And I realized how much ableism I was caring about autism and about like specifically anything that was neuro, about neurodiversity or intellectual disabilities. Um, learning disabilities, anything that was about like kind of brain related, I was holding a lot of ableism. And so I had to like kind of really, first of all, confront that and tell myself that's not okay and work through it. You know, I worked through it. I talked to other autistic people, neurodivergent people. I read books around unmasking. There's a great book called Unmasking Autism. I, and, and like I read, you know, I read material and I processed what I said before I said, hey, I'm autistic. And now what's interesting is every time I say I'm autistic, usually, like, especially if it's on LinkedIn, usually about three people write to me saying, oh my gosh, thank you so much for, you know, saying that you are because my son, blah, 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 or I am blah, blah, blah. Like, I always get like a story back and it's really, and I realized that, okay, I am a leader in this community and people see me um, as a leader in this community. And if I can't, um, dismantle the stereotype myself who is and so now it's like it's almost like um in a way it's like uh, like representation matters and not all autistic people are like me or but you know representation matters and it's it's important to just continue continue to dismantle the stereotypes around any type of like label mm -hmm. okay yes i just want to say thank you for being here and sharing your story Thank you. It, it really resonates a lot with me. I became disabled at the age of 35. And, you know, I, I dealt with a lot of denial and, and issues. And so it, I, I kind of stumbled upon this symposium on a journey of my own coming back to school this semester and seeing a lot of ableism. Mm -hmm. I can only audit a class, <laughs> but it's a good step, you know, and it's, it's allowed me to have a voice and now this is encouraging to see that there's there's more people that are joining this, you know, very necessary task in life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so well, thank, thank you. you. For everything you've been through. And, and one of the things as a 43-year-old woman, I'm, I'm very terrified of getting a stroke because of just the amount of stress dealing with ableism and and lack of accessibility and access and um, so it's 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 a it's a real true joy to to see there's there's more people willing and wanting to be involved <laughs> yeah no absolutely what your name again is jasmine thank you so much jasmine yeah. for sharing so i just want to close off with um you know your small actions do can lead to big change and you know we're all born with gifts like we all have different gifts that we're born with or, or are developed throughout throughout our lives. And, you know, activism doesn't have to be one color, you know? I mean, for me, like, I'll be very honest, I chose to dance because I don't like to speak. <laughs> and I'm here <laughs> as a keynote speaker <laughs> now. And now it's like, well, I embrace my speaking as an extension of my dancing, and I have a bigger purpose behind it. So it gives me a lot of energy to be able to share my voice in this way. But, like, you know, we all have strengths, skills, passions, you know, et cetera, and really use that. Um, I was actually at Google yesterday. I was at the Google, their first Google Inclusion and Equity Google, sorry, Google's Product Product Inclusion and Equity Summit, and um, gave their closing keynote. And you know what's what's interesting is whether I come to a college campus, to a tech company, or you know at the elementary school, it's like 
and, and different ages, different professions, different, you know, whatever it might be, it's like we're all kind of the same in terms of uh, the, the challenges that we each deal with, um, regardless of, you know, status or regardless of where you are in your career. So that's, that's been like a really eye-opening thing. And what connects all of this with my work is dance. Like it's the universal language of dance that I bring into all these different types of communities. So I really encourage you um, just, again, high, my high school years, taking out a pencil, writing down seven names that led to uh, lasting change at my, at my, my high school. Um, and I keep that in mind. Like sometimes little things that we do may not think that they count, but they do. I like to say that inclusion is almost like a lifestyle. Um, for example, um, like after doing this work, whenever I have a friend outing, and okay, half of my friends have, have disabilities. So just naturally, I'm asking myself, okay, is, did the, is the restaurant that I'm choosing, is this gonna accommodate everyone, everyone, uh, everyone's access needs? Um, is, it, is it like dietary you know, needs? Is it gonna, is, is, are we able to make food work? Like what, you know, are we able to make the bathroom work? Like, you know, like that it's become kind of a um, lifestyle. Uh, you know, whenever I embark in a space, you know, or like, an, like, a, like a hobby activity, I keep on asking myself, who's left out? What can I do? So, so something that I started is roller skating with the pandemic and I go to the rink and I skate and I'm also part of an artistic roller skating team and it's been wonderful. Um, but I keep on asking myself who is excluded. So just three weeks ago, I went to the owner of the rink and say, hey, can we do like a once a month spectrum skate? <laughs> I just came up with the name, like literally right before I talked to him, I said, I said, what's spectrum skate? I said, well, this will be like an hour or maybe 90 minutes where we, um, we accommodate those that just need a little bit of extra support to skate. So that might be just making sure that the music is not too loud and the lights are not flashing all over the place. And for someone that needs an extra hand learning to skate that we, have volunteers but and so like every single person's needs is going to be different but throwing especially a child with uh, with various mobility challenges into a rink and having them to expect to just figure it out doesn't quite always work some people just need a little bit of extra support and maybe after that extra support they'll be able to go into a regular session and he's like that sounds interesting let's talk about it more so we're going to probably start that i think i'm hoping to I'm hoping that he he's able to accommodate, do a test run by December, like with maybe like 10, 10 skaters, you know, but that's me. Like, I just can't help it, but I love skating and who's excluded, you know, how can we make that work? So anyways, um, yes, one last question. And I'm going to hang out, by the way, y'all, a little bit. So if anybody who does want to continue to just jam, oh, jam around, um, you can talk. Yes. I'm just curious what the name of the ring is. Fountain Valley Skating okay. Center. Oh, yes, I'm based in um, Orange County. So Fountain Valley Skating Center. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Oh, could I take a quick selfie? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I don't know how to do this other than um, can everyone come behind my camera? <laughs> I can also take a picture if you want. Oh, no, no. All right. I like the selfie. <laughs> we're going to try to get everyone in. All right, I think we're close. We're close. We're close. Yay. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you. Um, do you want to, if you don't want to talk to us today, and maybe I'll just shoot you an email mm -hmm. later. Um, what you were talking about with.